Well, this is um, my first time at CNI. I'm uh, terribly excited to be here, more than a, a little bit fearful. Um, I have only been um, uh, a resident of the library for about a year and a half, um, having begun my career and had what I hope is just but the first part of it um, as a professor in the Department of Classical Studies and only uh, recently uh, a joint appointment um, to the library as well. So I'm here to, today to give you a bit of an update um, on an effort that's underway at the Duke Collaboratory for Classics Computing, um, which is a three-person team in uh, Duke University Libraries, um, which consists of myself. I'm a professor of classical studies and history, and now jointly appointed in the library, and my two colleagues, a couple of brilliant software developers, Hugh Kalis, um, who is a classics PhD and a librarian and a software developer, and Ryan Bauman. Um, our mandate is essentially research and development of tools and services that furnish core infrastructure uh, to the various fields that fall under the general domain of classical studies, but um, uh, whose uh, impact we hope will reach well beyond the walls um, of that uh, rather narrowly construed discipline. And uh, we're, we're able to do this exciting new thing in no small part thanks to the generosity of the Mellon Foundation, which I am absolutely thrilled to acknowledge. The project I'm going to talk about today is called um, IDES, um, Integrating Digital Epigraphies, and builds on work that we've been doing for about a decade now in epigraphies much younger and much kinder sister discipline. Attending an epigraphic conference was once described to me by my advisor as like walking into a room full of velociraptors wearing a suit made of pork chops, which I assume is why the audience is the size uh, um, as it is for today. Um, so first, I want to give you a little bit of a word, uh, a little bit of introduction um, to a project that uh, uh, we spent a, a good bit of the last decade uh, working on, um, again with the generous support of the Mellon Foundation, um, uh, as a, a way of furnishing a bit of context and introduction to this other project uh, that's underway called IDES. So the late 19th uh, century, uh, in the late 19th century, documents written on papyrus, antiquities paper, this is our word uh, paper, started coming out of the dry sands of Egypt. Um, we discovered letters, tax returns, love mail, hate mail, marriage contracts, divorce agreements, sales, leases, receipts, magical potions, uh, petitions, administrative correspondence, minutes of um, um, uh, court proceedings, the list could go on and on. These things, as you are seeing up here, um, are pretty fantastic. Uh, this is a letter from uh, a husband to um, his expecting wife with uh, particularly awful uh, instructions. Um, these things, in other words, are fascinating, and they can be hard to deal with um, as well. Uh, they're often damaged. The Greek is non-standard. Uh, these documents cover an array of highly technical subjects. Um, uh, their provenance is tricky. Their chronologies are tricky. The barrier to entry is just very, very high. Well, one result of this is that from the very beginning of the field, the curation of the physical object and the scholarly interpretation of the text born on it have always been intertwined. Uh, collaboration um, has always been necessary from the very beginning of the discipline. Moreover, since the papyri offer almost our only clear view on the kinds of things that uh, appeared in ephemeral documentation, uh, our only part of classical antiquity from which women's voices are directly heard, for example, um, their uh, contents are of really very wide interest, not just to technically minded specialists, but to normal people with the result that accessibility has also been uh, an imperative from the very beginning of the discipline. And finally, uh, libraries have historically been the owners, conservators, and catalogers of these objects, uh, so that a culture of sharing and work based on uh, clearly developed standards has also been a key development, a key feature um, of development in this space since the very beginning. Now, as early as 1982, um, uh, Papyrology started to develop a number of digital tools to support research in this very technical space. Um, Duke at the lead, 
uh, I was 10 years old and not yet there. Um, and in the early 2000s, um, we at Duke started working to integrate these various resources under a common standard in a shared and open environment called papyri.info. Um, very quickly, uh, we bring together the so-called Duke Data Bank of Documentary Papyri, uh, a repository of some 60,000 Latin, Greek, and Coptic Egyptian documents written on papyrus and similar surfaces, the Heidelberger Gesamtverzeichnis, which is a database of scholarly metadata covering more or less the same set of texts, date, provenance, document genre, controlled keywords, the Advanced Papyrological Information System, uh, a set of institutional curatorial catalog records for many of these same papyri and many thousands others besides, um, and very importantly, images um, of the same. The Bibliographie Papyrologique, a quarterly scientific um, bibliography of the discipline, and last, um, a project called Trismegistos um, out of Leuven, which is um, a crazy, varied, and rich uh, set of scholarly metadata on a wide array of subjects from prosopography to onomastics to institutional inventory numbers. They keep better track of inventory numbers than inst the institutions that hold the objects um, do. Um, and we brought them together under a site called um, papyri.info. Now, we didn't just bring them together, um, but in fact, we allow anyone to create an account, to log in, to add and amend existing texts, to translate them, to redate them, or otherwise change the metadata, and not just the text and translation, but also these institutional uh, metadata records, which in the case of APIS means people in the crowd are in effect authoring or amending uh, the catalog records of institutions like Duke, uh, which is a pretty interesting um, phenomenon. And we then pass all of these through a rigorous and completely transparent, non-anonymous peer review process, eventually push the results back to the canonical repository. This is all citable, this is all permanent, this is all transparent, this is all Git in the back end. Now, since going live, uh, about five years or so ago, thousands of um, already print published um, papyri have been entered into the system. Hundreds of emendations have been proposed and many of them accepted by junior and senior scholars alike. I can't tell you how many translations have been added, some of them by undergrads. There is a team of undergrads at BYU that is systematically translating the largest archive of Greek documentary papyri from antiquity um, uh, and um, passing through um, peer review by um, internationally recognized um, scholars. Um, there have even been documents that have been published directly to the database, in effect, skipping over traditional print publication. This place has, in less than five years, become in many ways the center of a discipline. Um, and in that place, we hear, I think, more loudly and clearly than we did before, the voices of graduate students, the voices of our junior colleagues, the voices of women who constitute now 50% of the editorial board of the project. There is, among um, cognate uh, journals in this field, I don't think a single one uh, that can boast um, those kinds of numbers. So far as I can tell, there's been no blowback um, about the non-anonymous peer review. Uh, we gently told one uh, colleague who tends to be a little mean uh, that his meanness would be a possession for all time and exposed to everyone. And rather than quit, he promptly started being nice. Who'd have thought? Um, there's, so far as I can tell, um, no reluctance on the part of junior scholars who are afraid that if they do their work here, they won't get tenure. And as far as I can tell, no reluctance on the part of senior scholars who are afraid that this is a piece of junk. It is great, and it works. So fresh from uh, this experience, it took about a decade and wasn't terribly easy, um, we decided um, we'd try to create something similar for Greek epigraphy. This is what I'm going to talk about um, today. Now, epigraphy is the study of public documents carved on stone and erected for all to see, and antiquity was just carpeted in these things. Maybe something like 500,000 of them in Greek survive, and somewhere around 300,000 published um, in some form. Countless thousands of those uh, republished many times over in many um, print editions. 
In this space, we have laws and decrees, oracles and sacred regulations, letters from kings and emperors and letters back to them, records of interstate arbitration, funerary epitaphs by the thousands, hymns, inventories, financial documents, building contracts. Again, a very huge uh, variety of document types in very, very large number from across the footprint of Greco-Roman antiquity spanning in effect from Ireland to Afghanistan. Um, again, uh, this is a situation in which there is a very high return um, on um, scholarly investigation into this domain and also one with a very high barrier to entry. This isn't very clear on my screen, but I hope what you can see is not much of an inscription. Now, um, all of the complexities that um, inhere in the study of papyri uh, belong in this space as well, and plenty of others besides. Uh, the texts are more numerous by an order of magnitude and come from a wide range um, of ancient places and no less significant, perhaps even more so, modern nations, which tend to have um, potentially different dispositions with regard to um, uh, how, how nicely they play with others when it comes to their cultural heritage. The date and provenance of these documents is often much harder to control than um, as is the case with the papyri. And many, many stones um, are now lost or destroyed owing to war or other misadventure. And the objects uh, tend to be housed in museums rather than in libraries, with the result that the field's disposition to openness is often quite different from that of papyrology, which tends to be driven by libraries. So here, too, um, the work uh, is hard. Um, and just too vast to do without collaboration. There aren't enough epigraphists to do this work. There aren't enough papyrologists in the world to do this work. The very best papyrologist ever to live, Herbert Udy, um, who did nothing, had no teaching responsibilities, and whose window in the office um, had a, a direct line of sight to the window in his house, and his wife would wave when it was time to do things like eat. He said working full time, he could edit about one papyrus um, every two weeks. That's 26 a year. There are 180,000 um, in Vienna, another 150,000 in Berlin. This is not the work that even a handful of Mi the Michael Jordans of papyrology and epigraphy can just do. Um, but. Uh, um, uh, on the bright side, uh, in the case of epigraphy, as in the case of papyrology, we are fortunate to be graced by a number of very uh, useful tools. So part of what we're doing with this project that we call IDES um, is to bring together um, a handful of tools that already exist, um, clean up the data in certain ways, and start to build capacities um, on top of that. And before I describe what's available here and the work we've started to do, I'll, I'll offer a word on what we hope eventually to help contribute to. That is the kind of thing um, we fantasize about in our uh, joint space in the library. And this is a world in which, say, an undergraduate studying abroad, or a tourist, or a citizen who's concerned about risks to cultural heritage sites can download a simple smartphone app, snap a photo of an ancient inscription, upload the image to their Flickr account or whatever, um, and also the metadata including um, who they are and the geo coordinates under an open license into our institutional repository something that triggers a set of processes that um, verify whether we have other images of the same, we're pretty good at that right now, and ask the user, is this the stone you're looking at? If so, we think we have another photo of it here um, in, in the uh, archive. The, the student casts the vote, yes, no, we record and attribute that vote. Um, align the image with existing transcriptions, um, if possible. Again, asking the user, we think this text has been published already. Does this look like the Greek text you see um, on the stone? User casts a vote, yes or no, we, we record that. Alert the reader to relevant secondary literature on the object if we know any about it. Now, we're not yet there, um, but we've made a start, uh, and again, working with others uh, as we did with the papyri. 
As I mentioned, Greek epigraphy is fortunate to have several substantial online tools at its disposal. And all of them, though, are derived from prior and, in one particular case, um, a concurrent uh, print resource which turns out to have really considerable impact on the development of linked approaches to um, uh, collaboration across the multiple resources, which I'll get to in a minute. So first, the Packard Humanities Institute, um, which has um, been um, uh, for, I don't know, 30 years now, uh, digitizing something like 220,000 transcriptions of ancient uh, Greek texts from um, inscriptions. Thousands of these texts exist in duplicate editions. Each edition carries a unique identifier, but there is no such thing in this project or any other uh, as an identifier that corresponds to the object from which these multiple editions derive. We control only bibliography, not the objects, in other words, um, as is done um, in, in print. Um, and uh, texts are named and discoverable by a system of abbreviated bibliographic reference that is intended to be read by a human rather than by a machine, some of which uh, is in reasonably wide use, much of which is not. That is, the names by which they call things are not the names by which most other people call things, but that's okay. Um, second, the Supplementum Epigraphicum Graecum, or SEG, is an annual publication that summarizes books and articles that concern Greek epigraphy in some way. And it's arranged and cited by volumes and sequentially numbered entries uh, within those volumes. Its tens of thousands of entries feature hundreds of thousands of citations to published inscriptions. This digital project um, uh, is the successor to a print project that began about a century ago. Um, uh, uh, SEG began its life that long ago on paper and continues uh, on paper as well, concurrent to its digital instance. All past volumes have been retro-digitized, and as a few, vo few volumes ago, um, each new volume appears both in print um, and online at more or less the same time. Most, but not all, of these hundreds of thousands of references have been extracted from the digital versions of the records by a combination of machine and hand processes um, and reside in a series of XML files uh, which the director of the digital effort very generously shared with us. Now, these citations also use a system of human readable abbreviated bibliographic references which only partly overlaps with that of Phi. Also, like Phi, uh, SEG has no control over objects only over these semi-standardized bibliographical references to the objects. Now, I mentioned 28 minutes ago uh, that thousands of these texts have been published many, many times over, repeatedly in journals and books, as is the standard practice of the field, each time each new publication getting its own newly minted abbreviated bibliographic reference. Well, the Dizionario Griego Espanol um, years ago decided that if they wanted to cite Greek inscriptions, they had better keep track of republications. Nothing would be more embarrassing than citing the 10 instances of a word as appears in Greek repigraphy, only to have someone point out that you just cited the same inscription that has been republished 10 different times. This has happened. You don't want it to happen to you. So they invented yet a third system of abbreviation and started entering the indexes of journals, books, and articles that refer to inscriptions into a database that they've called CLAROS. Um, and there exist here more than a million and a half pairs that in effect take the form of an index for publication X, see publication Y. All right, these doublets contain no more semantics than that, no verbs, these are not triples. They just entered thousands of indexes, A, B, two columns, and they have 1.6 million of those. Um, they do not distinguish um, uh, publication X is a republication of the text found at publication Y, for example, from publication X contains a translation of the text found in publication Y, 
from, for example, publication X contains a totally unrelated inscription, but which nevertheless was carved on the back of the stone that is, contains um, the text published in publication Y. Just A, B, all right? They just entered indices. These are really profound differences. Um, and uh, like the others, uh, Claros also can't control objects, but only references to them. So all three um, of these projects feature data the extent of whose semantics is essentially for this, see that. And we have those by the millions, all right? Um, all using only partly overlapping naming systems. In effect, all three projects have operationalized in the digital space the logic of a print object um, and especially the index. The impact of this is really profound if you want to actually build something atop that where the semantics are of the utmost importance. Okay, so at the risk of overwhelming you with details, I'll mention just a couple more and I'll try to wrap it up at around the 23 minute mark so that we can have some discussion. Now, of course, thousands upon thousands of inscriptions are referred to in published secondary literature, um, in almost all cases using yet different systems of a, a, um, bibliographic abbreviation. Um, JSTOR has very kindly shared both page images and OCR for classics journals with us so that we've been able to start extracting um, some of these bibliographic references. This, of course, is not easy because a standard epigraphic bibliographic reference looks like this, which is totally unambiguous to a person or at least to an epigraphist pretending to be one and is also very difficult on a machine in order to get good OCR uh, recognition or machine parsing of what is here, both a bibliographic uh, citation and a citation to the document structure collapsed into one. Um, this is a real bear um, to OCR write and then for us to pull out of the data and align um, with the other resources that we have. And finally, each year, countless students and tourists photograph inscriptions, in some cases, inscriptions for which there is no previously published photograph anywhere. Um, in other cases, inscriptions that have been thought, that are thought to have been lost, um, and put them up somewhere online, on places like Flickr, and we've started harvesting um, uh, open licensed images of inscriptions from Flickr and based on a training set of a couple thousand hand verified text to image mappings, we're now able to a relative degree of accuracy to group multiple images of the same inscription, which is a non-trivial task. And much more interestingly, we're now on track to being able to map computationally images um, of inscriptions to existing transcriptions where they exist, using humans then only to accept or reject alignment candidates. That's going to be spectacular when it's in a place where I can show you, and we can talk more about that um, uh, if you like. The first point I want to make here is that a number of projects um, have collected a mountain of data painstakingly, in some cases over a century, for the most part exacting and reliable, but done under um, the reigning logic of the day, that is the print book, not, not anything that we can use out of the box now. Second, our partners have been extremely generous about sharing. Uh, there has been no barrier to cooperation here. And these are projects that um, have variously different funding models. Uh, SEG is a publication of, of Brill, uh, which is in, in the business of uh, trying to make an awful lot of money. Um, and it's, it's to their incredible credit that they've been so generous um, in sharing data with us. Um, Third, uh, the semantics of the data, however, are so lean that it's nearly impossible to leverage the work of one of the projects uh, to the benefit of the other without doing a lot of heavy lifting. And the heavy lifting is what we've been about. We want, for example, users to be able to assert in a stable and citable and vetted way that the text in one database has been translated in another, and in yet another has a corresponding image that shows that the text should be reconstructed in some different fashion, which it turns out runs contrary to an argument advanced in an article that happens to be in JSTOR. Okay? Nothing like this is even almost achievable now in this space, um, despite the wealth of information that looks like it ought to be uh, relatable to each other. 
So to be able to support this, we'd have to, in the first case, be able to mint unique IDs for the epigraphic objects, not the derivative um, editions of them, which is the, um, the box within which all epigraphists think today. Uh, to relate publications of the same um, to those objects and to each other in controlled and semantically rich ways. We need to be able to say that X translates edition Y, which is an edition of inscription A. We need to be able to attribute complex assertions about these relationships. Mary says that translation X has to be changed in accordance with Fred's new proposed um, correction, which itself was offered in the light of a newly identified fragment of that same stone. This kind of thing happens all the time in this trade, and we have no um, way of controlling um, and providencing those kinds of assertions. So the, the first step here um, is to uh, parse and align the millions of semi-normalized, only partly overlapping um, bibliographic references to these publications that we've harvested from Phi, from SEG, from Claros, and from JSTOR doing our best where we can to infer some um, semantic significance from the structure of the data. SEG, um, these entries are, are written in prose and they have developed a kind of uh, structure to them so that we can tell when the first word, the first string that appears in an entry is a non-word and seems to be an epigraphic citation that the entry is in fact about um, that text principally, not just mentions that text. And if it is followed by another reference that is in parentheses but not in square brackets, um, then this was the convention for indicating that this was an edition that superseded a prior edition, right? Um, so there's some semantics that we can squeeze out of the free text um, that, that comes into us. Uh, not a whole lot, um, uh, but some. Um, our first pass at this um, lives in a project, um, uh, lives at ides.io. So I'll just walk you real quickly down um, what the human interface um, looks like right now. This is meant for machine consumption, and, and um, right now we just have the um, human interface for, for debugging. Um, so let's say I want to go um, visit an inscription that humans call IG1 cubed 40. Um, I drill down um, to what we think we know about IG and uh, from there to what we think we know about IG1 cubed, and from there what we think we know about the document called number 40 uh, within IG1 cubed 40. Um, you can see here um, that we have minted a unique identifier um, for the object, not for the bibliographic uh, reference to it and um, will later support annotation that allows users to lump and split things against the identifier um, so that we can start to clean up the gigantic harvest of um, publications. Um, you can tell that we've been able to infer from the data that this edition supersedes to others, um, where it says sites. These are prior editions of the same text, and we just had to sort of, with some gymnastics, infer that from the structure of a variety of records. Um, and uh, we've been able to infer that this text is the main topic of a bunch of SEG entries, that it is cited by a number of other resources. And by hitting the JSTOR API just for these three strings that we know of um, as common references to this object, not as their other cognate bibliographical rep uh, representations, we're able to pull in articles um, that cite them. There are no um, open licensed photos of this stone uh, on Flickr. If there were, you'd see them. So the next step, um, which we've only just begun, is a user interface that allows um, users to create new relationships, to modify or deprecate existing ones, to mint new uh, identifiers, where, for example, a composite text has to be split up, to deprecate old ones, where, for example, previously discrete fragments are conjoined. Um, again, this happens all the time in this field. And in general, to allow users to add the kind of rich semantics that the data streams that we have, by and large, uh, lack. That is, to add in a general way to the vast property graph that stores these provenanced and contingent relationships behind um, all of this that I'm showing you uh, now. 
Now, we've, this, is, this is only a part of the effort. Um, we've also started a similarly harebrained and massive effort to align geospatial data asso associated with these um, inscriptions that we pulled out of PHI and SEG, um, aligning the very loosely standardized representation of provenance in those resources with the much more closely uh, vetted um, geodata in Pleiades, a vetted gazetteer of ancient place names, and with the crowdsourced um, data from GeoNames, and we've just started to align that um, set um, with the recently released Getty Thesaurus of Geographic Names. If I start in on this, we'll never get out of here, but um, the basic point here is that the geodata is as gnarly and horrendous and <laughs> semantics free as the publication data um, are. Um, okay, so eventually, uh, what I'm showing you up uh, here is um, just that we have a variety of um, um, uh, very preliminary APIs that allow you to get um, different representations of, of the data out of the graph. So eventually, um, uh, IDES means to be at least two things. Um, first of all, the future basis via a set of services, tools, trusted repositories, for curating the relationships across digital epigraphies, um, multiple uh, resources. And in the meantime, uh, the place and mechanism for, in effect, redoing um, to modern machine actionable spec, not just the 19th century's enormous effort at an initial pass at data creation, but also the late 20th century's effort at migrating all of this to digital both of which need to be redone from the very beginning, or else we'll build nothing on top of it. Now, neither of these endeavors, um, I fear, sounds very sexy or perhaps even very fundable, um, but they are, I think, the sine qua non for meaningful collaborative network-based progress in this field. Uh, there is no other way forward uh, than one that begins with redoing two centuries uh, worth of work. It's worth it. Um, that's where we've been concentrating our efforts with IDES, um, and um, we'll either crack it <laughs> or it'll crack us, and um, we'll find out which of those is the case soon enough. So I thank you for your patience, and um, um, let's get the details if you like it.